go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And uh, then we'll uh, uh, on the square, make it full screen. Stop uh, this. Uh, start where we stopped last week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time just to be together, fellowship with one another and fellowship around your word. We do pray for those who can't be here with us who would love to be. And we uh, pray that they will be sensitive to the awareness of your presence with them. We pray for their uh, your hand of healing to be upon them. We know you've got a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And we hold these up before you uh, in a very special way and, and uh, look forward to seeing what you do uh, in the response of asking for your help. We uh, love you because you've loved us first and drawn us unto yourself. So this morning, we pray you'll um, guide us as we study these portions of your word uh, this morning that uh, have to do with the, the priest's uh, service in the days gone by and how it relates to us as priests of, the, of yours in these days too. Pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I'm going to, you remember that uh, passage we read where uh, in the consecration service, uh, as they killed um, uh, the sacrifice and shed its blood, you remember where they where um, uh, they sprinkled the blood for um, uh, well consecrating. I didn't, took it off the board. Had the word up there, consecrate. The, a person sets aside for a special job, chosen by God to do a certain thing, and a priest uh, is. Fits right into that. And you remember they were dedicated by the sprinkling of blood and water. You remember where they, uh, what? Uh, right ear. The right ear. Yeah. And right, right side of the face also. Well, yeah. yeah, you're right. It was right ear, right thumb, and the right big toe. They especially put blood in those three places. And I told you, I thought uh, the Bible doesn't come right out and say it, but I thought it probably was indicating uh, that uh, the right ear was that um, it's the blood stained ear that uh, needs to be uh, listening to the leadership of God in, in a priest's life. Uh, so that's dedicated. His thumb. Uh, uh, Anointing the thumb with the blood also uh, applied uh, the, the expectation that a priest is to, what do you do with your hands? Work? So the dedicating the, hand, the thumb there is a way of saying that uh, the priest is to be involved in doing God's work. And uh, the big toe, uh, I thought might have be indicating the fact that a priest is to walk um, in uh, God's ways, have a lifestyle that is, um, honors and glorifies him. The only reason I'm going back to mention that is because I found um, uh, another explanation for it. It's, uh, it. It agrees, but it says it in a different way. And I'm going to just read uh, this little paragraph here. And this is a paragraph uh, by a man, last name was McIntosh. It's a Canadian. And he does, uh, got all of his publishing work done in England. Um, and uh, his, he has a whole series of, of uh, books on the Old Testament, especially. And this is just one of them. And uh, the first printing on this was done in 1880. This has uh, been around a while. He uh, uh, was publicly known by 1860. His first publishing of this was 1880. And the last uh, edition was the 27th printing. It was done here in the United States in 1965. What's that say? What's that tell you about this writer? That'd Anything? Yeah. That'd be pretty good. <laughs> must be very, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, he must be very good because 
then for the last 150 years, mm -hmm. when it came to the study of Leviticus, uh, this, this is the book that was on their, on their shelf. So anyway, I, um, what he had to say was very meaningful to me. But let me read what, how he says it. He says, uh, <coughs> this, uh, this passage that has this in it uh, is prominent with the blood occupies uh, consecration of the priest. He says it this way, a blood-stained ear was needed to hearken to the divine communications. Read. That's true. And uh, uh, then he goes on to say, a blood-stained hand was needed to execute the services of the sanctuary. That's the word. I called it the word. And, he, and then the last, a blood-stained foot was needed to tread the courts of the Lord's house. He said that a little bit differently, but I agree with him. As to, he uses the word tread. I said it, it's the, the, the walk of the priest is to be appropriate to who they're serving uh, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the ministry. So he says all this is perfect in its way. Uh, the shedding of blood was the ground or grand foundation of all sacrifice for sin. And he goes on to explain that. And he finally quotes Hebrews um, chapter 9, verse 22, where even in the New Testament tells us there without equivocation at all that almost all things are by the law purged by blood. That's true today, just as well as it was true 150 years of here, as well as it was when it was written back uh, in the uh, in the history of Israel. So I thought you might enjoy hearing about this this particular man. So if you ever get a book, uh, an opportunity to buy a book by by him, and his last name is Macintosh, uh, you probably do well. The only reason I have it. Uh, is because Mary Jane went to Bible College in Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. So she was, she was on Canadian soil for four years. And uh, that's where this, this was out of her library. And um, so uh, otherwise I would have probably never seen that. But remember the name Macintosh from back in the 1800s. All right. Well, I uh, wanted to mention that. <laughs> And uh, welcome. <laughs> and then, uh, and then also uh, wanted to touch. We I, we talked started to talk anyway about crowns, um, and um, um, and we were in Leviticus here studying that portion um, and uh, of the dedication, and the crowns came up, and that, what came up was the term. Uh, the holy crown. What's the holy crown? I don't know if we've talked about it yet or not, but uh, let me get there to myself also. Let's see. Uh, Exodus 29, verse 6. You want to join me there? Exodus 29, verse 6 is where we find this. Without looking, do you remember in your studies? I hope you studied through this. What the uh, the holy crown was uh, for the high priest? Yeah. Yeah. It was. You have a turban, and uh, then you had a band uh, made out of very fine materials, and they kind of twisted it, wound it up. So like you would take a uh, like a washcloth and you'd turn it until it became like a rope right and then it would go around and on the front of that rope that rope by the way was a blue rope because it went right along with the other uh, portions of the priest's uh, clothing for service and this they'd wrap this rope this blue fine blue rope here and right on the front of it was, that golden plate. And uh, on that golden plate, we had an engravement that said, Holy 
unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. And uh, it, it was something that um, Scripture displays that it was typically that which the Israelite looked to when the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies. Uh, what he was entering into there with was all the sins of the people. Uh, it was so important that the, the priest himself had to go in uh, with a sacrifice for himself first. Once he was clean, then he would enter in with uh, all the sins of, of, the, of Israel at that time uh, before a holy God who was uh, right there visibly in the cloud and in the fire. So he would walk right into the presence of God, and he knew, because God told him, that if you ever entered into here with sin, it would be the end of your life here. It would be the end of your service here. Uh, you don't enter the presence of God with sin. And so uh, this was how important the job of a high priest was uh, in the nation of Israel. And so uh, uh, this crown meant a lot more to them than it would have meant to us unless we studied enough to realize how important it was to God. I'm just in, uh, I, I said 29.6, I think, where you shall set the turban on the head and put the holy, holy crown on the turban. That's an interesting phrase it was to me. Why did he call it? Why didn't he just say a crown? Why did he say a holy crown? Uh, and uh, he said, and then after that's done, then you take the uh, anointing oil and, and anoint the individual up for uh, doing uh, that work of uh, consecrating whatever was being taken in before God. But also um, look up at, uh, go back one chapter to chapter 28, and uh, you, you see it mentioned here. Um, in verse 36 um, and uh, he just get, has finished talking about the bells around the skirt okay. and why those were there and what they accomplished and uh, was told by God that uh, when he enters and leaves the holy place before the Lord that would be the holy of holies he said this was needed that he may not die that's how serious it was. So he got, goes on to verse 36 and he says, you shall make a plate of pure gold and you shall engrave engrave on it like the engravings of a seal. What's it say on there? Holiness to the Lord. Holiness to the Lord. Yeah. And that's what he, he was, uh, um, his uh, job was, his emphasis was, was to resent I represent before God the nation, the people of Israel. So he was entering right into God's presence as a representative of the people. Yeah. So he wasn't just there for himself at all. He was there for the people at this point. And this bar on the front of him uh, was not only a testimony, but it was uh, kind of a uh, an insurance Reminder, this this is uh, this is the issue of man's uh, sin being taken care of because you're taking it in here before me so I can deal with it. So uh, to me, he was underscoring and emphasizing uh, very clearly and very definitely to the high priest and to the people that what he's doing is a matter of life and death. And yeah, I could I would say matter of life and death physically, matter of life and death. He's dealing with sin, uh, spiritual and eternally. So uh, enough said on that. We were, but I wanted to touch base with that just uh, from our our previous study. We kind of stopped on it, so I didn't. Well, you know, we get down in the last five minutes, we get nervous and jerky, and I don't know if we're paying a lot of attention to what we're studying or not. But the, anyway, that that's it. Now we're um, actually moving into the next uh, lesson, which I hope you uh, have been 
doing this, but you were challenged to study uh, Leviticus 21 and 22. I hope you've been reading that. Um, but get there anyway, because uh, that's where we're going to be the rest of the morning. Leviticus 21. Leviticus. Yeah. <clears throat> these, this section here, these two chapters are very specific for the high priest. Um, if you, let's just read together. Someone read chapter 22, the allow the first two verses. 22, 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they profane not my holy name in those things which they hallow unto me. I am the Lord. What's that mean? Aaron and his sons? Would anything spring out of there to you? Is that 21? 22. 22. First two verses of chapter 22. Sorry, it's 21. There you look at it again. Take a minute and think about it. The Lord was telling Moses uh, to say this. Tell, let me read it in another translation, but it says the same thing. It's, uh, what did you read out of? Uh, King, King James. James. Good. And this is New American. This is how he, uh, these translators said the same thing, but using some different words. Tell Aaron and his sons to be careful with the holy gifts of the sons of Israel, which they dedicate to me, so as not to profane my holy name. I am the Lord. Did that clarify anything or bring anything before your understanding? as a question or a statement what is he saying to them you'll hear the lord pull moses aside to on purpose tell him something unique and special isn't that the same as when uh they said not to intermarry inter intermingle with the other tribes or with other peoples because they wanted to keep their people clean or on unblemished so that would mean that the priest is to keep himself uh from being tarnished by any sins that or influences from from the peoples would that be it yeah it's it's on the, it's on the very same line or on the very same uh uh thought uh very much so he says help He's saying, isn't he saying, don't be a bad example? I'm you, sure that you, you're going to be working for the heat. Yeah. And so don't be a bad example. Yeah. But this, yes. And how would they be a bad example? Well, he says, profane the word of God. So either verbally or by their actions, uh -huh. that they're not properly representing God. Yeah. So what was going on here? It's the big picture. You had a priest here at the tabernacle. You had a priest at the tabernacle. And you had Israelites all around them. And they would, um, during the year, what would a man or a woman do if they said, I sinned. I, I know I did something I wasn't supposed to do. Something God told me I should not do. I did or vice, vice versa around, uh, they they could have all of a sudden realized, you know what, God told me to do something and I'm not doing it. In other words, they became aware of a sin. What did they do about that? What could they do about that? Bring a sacrifice for me. You got it. Sure. They, had to do, uh, they had to bring a sacrifice. Uh, and that sacrifice had to fit the offense. And they bring us a bull, a lamb or whatever. Uh, they 
uh, was required by that kind of a sin, they'd bring it in and they would give that to the priest. And then what would happen was that animal would die, uh, his life would be, his blood would be shed, he, he would be taken and uh, uh, given as a sacrifice and the holy priest, uh, the uh, uh, high priest would take that uh, blood and also uh, apply it where it had to be applied. What this, what this verse is talking about is you've got a high priest and you've got a sinner that comes to him and a sinner brings a price of sin. And that, that uh, sacrifice in God's eyes is holy. It's special. It's unto him. It's something that he demanded or whatever sin was being atoned for. So that the focus then is on that gift, that sacrifice that's being brought. God is telling the priest, don't you treat that sin payment carelessly. That's mine. Be very careful. Listen to it again. Tell Aaron and sons to be careful with the holy gifts. Now, the King James says it a little different way, mm -hmm. but it says the same thing. You uh, be careful with the holy gifts of the son. And by the way, gifts is in italics, even in mine. So the word gifts isn't in the original. But whatever they're bringing, this sacrifice, uh, is a gift of the sons of Israel. You be careful with them, which they dedicate to me as so as to not profane my name. In other words, if you treat them like nothing, you don't respect it, what of uh, what that sacrifice is, you profane my name. You're in a sense, you are you're um, um, giving a false message that does not represent me, and because I consider that offering, that gift is mine in a very special way and if you don't think that's important you profane my name i want us to get the import impact of this statement because uh, we are a holy priesthood set aside in the new testament day and uh without me uh, telling you I, I would like us all to give thought to what is there that i handle that's special to God, and how am I using it? How am I treating it? Is it my treating it as if it's not worth anything? It was just a religious expression or some way. Uh, I am profaning. I'm. What's it mean to defame? Uh, to uh, profane. If you profane someone, what do you do to it? Disrespecting yeah, yeah. yeah, it kind of spelled it out a little more um, down in verse 3. Whoever of all your descendants throughout your generations goes near the holy things, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> which the children of Israel dedicated to the Lord, while he has uncleanness upon him, that person shall be cut off. Yeah. From my practice. Right. That's taking it further. That's 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 uh but in the baseline, the foundational thought here is if I if I treat those things dedicated to the Lord in a careless way, I um, I profane, I make unclean uh that issue before God. You defile it. Defile uh, means to uh, uh, consider it ceremonially unfit for use and service. So um, um, that's our opening thought here for this. these two chapters, is that um, we are to keep sacred uh, things that are dedicated to the Lord. In fact, we're to keep uh, uh, 
them uh, sacred to the point of making sure that they don't get mixed with the secular. And uh, there's a lot of things in a Christian's life that uh, is tempting to take some of that of God's and mix it with the secular. That profanes God's name when we do that. That should start some wheels turning in our minds and in our brains. Um, and you think we're just one example of where many times or in some ways Christians take holy things of dedicated for, to God for him and his use and then use it with, in a secular way? Perhaps maybe some of the things that God has given us through the spirit, we use it for our own benefit. Like if we're a good speaker or something, we use it to promote ourselves with pride or something. Maybe just use misusing the gifts that the spirit has given us yeah, for right. our own use. Yeah. That could be. I think that's right. I think that's uh, a true statement. Uh, every person who's born again has been gifted. What are we doing with it? We treating it like it's really nothing important. Give it a little part-time <laughs> attention and ignore it the rest of the time. That's a good one. Do some churches uh, have habits with the world uh, and mix them together? Mm -hmm. Our church doesn't book, do it, but I know some churches who every Friday night have bingo. <laughs> <laughs> they're using they're using what uh, godly people have given for uh, God's work and uh, use them in, in worldly ways. That's just the thought that came into my mind. Do you any more come into yours? Music. In what way? Or the, go ahead. Well, they bring in music that isn't really glorifying of God. Okay. Something other. <laughs> I was thinking, I mean, we'll start with music too. Mm -hmm. Some people have a gift, mm -hmm. you know, that God has given them at hearts. You see them go into, you know, profession, a profession, and their roots were here, but they went popular music and kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And a lot of them, you know, I mean, they suffer for it. I, 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 I mean, uh, how many people will um, take the time God has given them and uh, they don't worship God on Sundays because they don't have time. They've got a ball game to go to. We had, uh, nobody here knows this, so I'm, you don't know who I'm talking about, but we had uh, an individual in our church years ago uh, who held an office, and he he was always uh, on the sports field Sunday mornings with his kids for different sports, because that was more important to him than this was. <laughs> the world's things took precedence over spiritual things. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon. But anyway, here's a place in God's Word where He was preparing the priesthood to uh, to be the go between before. Uh, between God and Israel, and uh, Israel was supposed to be the, in the beginning, supposed to be the in-between between the world and God, and Israel blew it so bad that uh, God had to change his, his uh, uh, plans to include not Israel as the, the whole uh, a people, of, who the whole Israel was to be priesthood, he had to change it down to just one tribe, out of out of uh, all twelve to be one to be the representative change that much was happening uh, at, at this point in time so uh, uh, there's a, a New Testament verse that I think goes right along with this and that's in Second uh, Corinthians six seventeen you don't have to turn there because I'll just uh, read it for you here yeah. Uh, the apostle wrote this, uh, Paul said, therefore, and he's talking about this issue, he says, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, 
and touch not the unclean thing. There's things that uh, are still going on in, in our church age uh, that needs the same attention. We do the same thing that Israel was tempted to do back uh, 2,500 years ago. So uh, he tells us uh, back in 1 Corinthians uh, 11 that uh, uh, verses 31 and 32 that we need to keep manage, managing judgment of the things that we have of God and that we're not mixing them with, with the world. Uh, and he tells us that and a reminder of that every time we take the Lord's table. We do it once a month here. But you take the Lord's table and, and one of his instructions uh, leading up to that is that you make sure your heart's clean before you take communion, before you take something that represents the blood and work of, of Jesus Christ in uh, the provision of salvation. You just don't come and treat that in a worldly way. Uh, that is... That is something we have to respect, something we have to honor uh, before we take communion. And what does he tell us that if we don't do that, what might happen? <laughs> Be ex like excommunicated or the Lord won't recognize us anymore. He tells us, he tells us right there, Paul writes in Corinthians, and he says, many of many Christians are sick. And the reason they're sick is because they disrespect the things of God. He says, not only are some sick, he says, some have died as a result of that. You know, you think of like Ananias and Sapphira, we all know that story. Mm -hmm. How they they uh, cheapened uh, what people were giving to, uh, here in the early days of the church. And so they... Uh, uh, they wanted the notoriety. They wanted the, the, the kudos for having done the same thing because other people were selling everything they had and giving it to the church. And the church would distribute it. And then they had an eye and said, oh, we want to be thought of as wonderful too. So they went out and sold theirs, right? And uh, where did they go wrong? They kept, they kept some. They kept some, but they brought the rest, gave it to the church and uh, in the in a way that the church was believing they that was all, and it wasn't they were getting some of it for themselves. So that's just a New Testament uh, illustration of what God is telling instructions to the uh, priesthood of the Old Testament to be careful about. Um, so just as a touch point around the uh, the priesthood. How did a priest become a priest in the first place, just in a general sense? By birth. By birth. Yeah. He didn't uh, go to some university and get a doctor's degree. He uh, didn't. Uh, uh, you have to be from the right tribe also. You have to be a Levite. You're, you're getting it exactly right. And sometimes even that wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And that's what I... Well, we're going to look at next. What that was necessary to be a priest uh, was, and you give it. You gave me all several good answers. And the one I think is the most inclusive is the first one that Jeanette gave. It, it was by birth, not by personal qualities. Um, in uh, um, now Leviticus twenty-one. Let's go back to twenty-one again if you've gone anywhere. And uh, in verse 21, verse 4, uh, I'd like that read out of the King James. <laughs> Who's got one? Okay. Four, 21, 4? 21, 4. But he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people to profane, to profane himself. What was he called? A priest? What's, what kind of a man? Chief, chief man. A chief man yeah. among his people. Um, mine doesn't use that particular phrase in there, but it 
he says um, he prof he shall not be a profane person mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, of the priestly family, because not all all of the children of a priestly family uh, are priests or can be priests. So it's very specific. God handpicks his priesthood through whom he's going to work. And uh, yeah, it, it's we say he became a priest by birth, but he was a priest by birth, but he was also uh, born into the right family and was the right kind of individual who didn't profane that which was holy. Uh, he also uh, was a leader from among his people. Uh, yet, even with that, even if a person was born in the right family, and even if that person uh, was um, uh, a leader among his people, he still had other requirements that he had to meet. He had to meet the tough regulations set by God, uh, or he would immediately um, be rejected. Got up here on the board. There's some certain things around the priesthood that depend on the, on the individual's conduct. What he does. Uh, what his response. Not how he thinks, but what he does. Uh, and uh, besides being born in the right family and so on, uh, there are disqualifications. There are things that will deny him ever being a priest. Are there things that deny a professing Christian from being a representative of God in this society? Are there things, are there things that disqualify us as well? Good question. I know we're looking back 2,500 years, but we're also uh, looking at people chosen by God to do a specific work. And everyone who is truly born again belongs to the priesthood of believers and we are a priesthood but listen to what he there are some qualifications are then we'll look at some things that will defile a person it'll damage them it'll make them ceremonially unclean right and then there are some um, <clears throat> that a person doesn't have good discretion what's discretion mm -hmm. well we would use a different words we would probably use good wisdom, choices. good choices, yeah. make the right choices. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are individuals who uh, uh, do not um, use discretion in uh, sacrificing, whether it's animals or uh, spiritual offerings. Okay, so um, that's where we're headed in but not in a real fine detail, just kind of hitting them on the, not just the mountaintops, but the ones that the, God's word actually spells out to us. Was the profaning himself, right after that it says, they shall not make a bald place on their heads, they shall not shave the edge of their beards, mm -hmm. or any cutting of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Like the pagans. Just before that, he was talking about pagans' worship. These are things that were commonly done uh, by pagans to appease their gods. And so they had these uh, little, they whipped themselves. And remember uh, up out on Mount Carmel there in the contest? Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they were cutting themselves and whipping themselves, trying to get their god to uh, start the fire. And uh, they couldn't do it. But those are some of the practices that uh, pagans would use. And the Israelites, in their spiritual life, started picking these things up and adding them to their, trying to add those things to the, their worship of the true and the holy, the only true and living God. And uh, God says, no. Um, it to be defiled means to be made uh, unclean. Um, but I wanted to back up here. We're still in 
um, chapter 21, first four verses. Uh, we, we're reading down through here, uh, and we want three times, one, two, three times he uses the word defile. So if you're interested in knowing uh, what would make a priest unclean for service? Uh, th this is going to give you a, a good starting place. Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, no one shall defile himself uh, for a dead person among his people. You know, uh, to touch a, a dead body would be, the priest would be unclean. Mm -hmm for a specific length of time and had to do certain things to remedy it. Verse two, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother and his father and his son and his daughter and his brother, just the immediate family. Also for the virgin sister who is near him because she has no husband, for her he may defile himself. In other words, if a sister died, he could, a priest could, touch her and not be defiled. Verse 4, he shall not defile himself as a relative by marriage among his people and so profane himself. We're going to see reading it a little further down. Gene picked it up at that point. <laughs> the thing that that um, anything that would profane him would make him um, unclean and unusable for being a priest and doing priestly duties. Um, but here in these first four, um, uh, the priest being mentioned here is, and I've got to make a distinction because it's in the scripture. Here he's talking about a norm, a regular priest, not the high priest. Because there's some, there's some of these we'll see are different between the priesthood and the high priest himself. And so we're going to see what what those are. Normally, um, if a priest touches a, a dead body, uh, then he'll be unclean for a whole week, for seven days. And uh, we get that from Numbers chapter 19. It tells us that. And that uh, he'll be unclean for, for that length of time. And he can't do anything of a priesthood nature because he's ceremonially ceremonially unfit. He would be disobeying God to do it. <clears throat> um, and Gene read the part about death practices among pagans. They would do these things, shaving, shaving the head, the beard, the eyebrows, the, cutting the body, the... Uh, and there will be other things included in this that we'll come to as well. But those are things that um, the true priesthood was in danger of picking up from pagan influence. Excuse me. Uh, go back to uh, uh, a couple of pages to uh, Leviticus 19. And in Leviticus 19, verses 27 and 28, uh, is where you would read that kind of instruction. We're not going to take the time, but you can see it there. 27 and 28. Uh, the 28 even includes, you shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead. That's what they were doing them for. Nor make any tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. So those are uh, forbidden to do for a priest. Um, we also see, well, we don't have to go back to Deuteronomy. Well, let's do it anyway. Uh, Deuteronomy 14. In Deuteronomy 14, here we read this, skipped in verse 1. <clears throat> you are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves nor shave your forehead for the sake of the dead. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people of his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And he goes on to name other things, but 
just want to underscore that. Uh, don't take up a, a pagan. Our Christian society worldwide has within it many Christian, we would call them denominations, who uh, do, the, do things that um, are taboo to the Lord, uh, and they do them uh, uh, in broad ways. Uh, I don't know. Can you think of any in, individual groups that do the th things that are ungodly that God uh, tells us we, we shouldn't be doing and can't do? Can you think of any? I think of a Harry Krishna. They shaved their head. They're not Christian, but yeah. Harry Krishna in the 70s. Yeah. yeah. Well, these <laughs> people, he's talking about aren't Christians either. Oh, okay. <laughs> there are people who do things that, for religious person. Uh, purposes that uh, God doesn't require. Uh, yeah. That's for priests also, right? That's not for the average. This is for priests. Uh, at this point, let me see here. Um, yeah, it's for any Israelite. Oh. Yeah. I had a couple things that I should have written down, but made me think of this was that um, um, our religion, Christianity, is full of pagan. Is I just one thing that uh, come to my mind was we're full of pagan practices, and we're full of, in the sense that we we use their the pagan um, ways of worshiping that are. Flawed terribly. What about the hill? We not, yeah, what about the hill Gomorrah pageant? That, that, that would be one. Yeah. Don't we celebrate Christmas? Yeah. Christmas come right out of paganism. Uh, and you could name uh, many of the other uh, days of that we celebrate that have come into the church right out of paganism. And uh, we celebrate them. Uh, what's the one there in the fall? We celebrate Halloween. Uh, Halloween. If you're a Christian, you shouldn't be. Uh, you shouldn't be celebrating Halloween. Right. Uh, you should be on that particular day. For instance, what could you celebrate that would be good? Reformation. That's the Reformation. The day of the Reformation is not the churches instead of. Celebrating the the uh, Reformation, we're celebrating paganism, uh, evil, and all of the all that it entails. Now we don't need to think much more. No. <laughs> we do know that that's out there. <laughs> we do know that's out there. Huh? Yes. Yeah. What came to me, you know, as you you look back in church history, you you see that in the good good intentions of Converting the heathens, as it were, the pagans, they sometimes kind of try to incorporate some of the pagan things. That let them, uh, and, you know, and I wonder if we sometimes in the modern Christian church kind of do the same things to make the world like us. Sure. And yeah. feel comfortable with us. So we'll kind of overlook certain things and yeah. just kind of because we want to try to uh, please everybody. It's like sort of the same be thing, acceptable. right? Kind of the same thing, right? Yeah. yeah. It's funny, it never works that way. No, it never yeah. does. It goes the other way, right? Yeah. That's like what the Israelites That's why they weren't supposed to marry outside of Israel. <laughs> they bring a wife. You know how wives do. That's right. No, I yeah. don't, Tim. This works. A husband, a husband. Don't get any deeper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's exactly, that's, that's exactly what Rome did. Uh, Christianized. Tried to paganize Christianity and and did a lot of uh, made a lot of holy days and all kinds of rules and regs that uh, and we could name some more, but I don't think we need to. Mm -hmm. um, the mega churches have done this with their like 
I'm blaming them. It's not just them. The music, we brought in, I mean, you know, different kinds of music, but also with the hieroglyphics, the smoke and the, oh, no, just yeah. all of the, oh, the entertainment so, sound. Yeah. Well, whatever, yeah, whatever it's the, the smoke and yeah, the I, lights and all of that, yeah. which make it look more like entertainment than worship. Yeah. And yeah, well, it's tough. Yeah, because it's popular, huh? So because it's popular, yeah. it hypes them up. It's too. Right? Yeah, and I know. Uh, well, it's like well, the Baptist, some Baptist churches where they start singing. I mean, no, okay, they'll go crazy. But they, uh, yeah, I gotta <laughs> I say, thought, with music on the on the table at the moment, I will say this about music: I don't care what genre of music you like. If it glorifies God, reveals him in what it says, and is an opportunity for us to praise him, to me, that's good music. I don't care what genre you use. Because uh, you could use even uh, good music uh, and uh, use it wrongly. And people start to worship their music instead of worshiping the God that the music should be leading them to. So I don't pick the genre, the type of music, I, except in the um, in the context of does it glorify God? Does it honor him? Is what's being sung about uh, revealing the nature of God and who he is and uh, reveal thankfulness and gratefulness and appreciation for for him and all that, that his plan of salvation involves. So I'll say that about music. Every one of us like one kind better than another. That doesn't bother me. I don't, uh, uh, the kind isn't what makes it right. Uh, that is the genre doesn't. Uh, uh, being down south for so many, so many years, country music, grew out of Christians, I think, grew out of Christian influence, and then it just went worldly as can be. You know, and you can take all kinds of music, good music, bad music, everything in between. What we, um, what, we what we need to really just justly evaluate music by is that it comes from the heart, and what does it say? Because I like some, you, I like some uh, uh, music out of each of the different kinds of music, uh, but every kind has some good in it, some good music, and some terrible music. <laughs> because the message is just horrible. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, uh, and even the way that it's uh, delivered makes makes a difference too. So. I'm looking at the clock. It's mm -hmm. we've got two minutes, and we are just getting started uh, in the uh, disqualification issue. We're starting in some of these. We'll get the funeral rites next week. Uh, we just mentioned uh, one piece of it. A regular priest, uh, a regular priest could um, uh, touch uh, an intimate family member, but we're going to find next week that that's not always true either. So we're going to stop right here and then pick it up with the rest of uh, that order of uh, study. We'll go from funeral rites to family relationships. And it's interesting that God has set aside special um, meaning and special relationships between his priesthood and the world's priesthood. And even the, the priesthood that he... Uh, began in the tabernacle started changing rapidly. Didn't take a hard, hard time at all for them to uh, become disqualified in uh, the ministry collectives. Let's pray and get into the uh, service. Father, thanks for again this morning. Use our time together for your own honor and glory. And we uh, give us ears to hear whatever is uh, you've laid on the heart of the pastor this morning. Bless our uh, ability to comprehend it and uh, adjust our life accordingly. 
for you're worthy of all our praise and all of our, um, you're worthy of all of our confidence. And we thank you for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.